Israel has launched a fresh set of attacks on southern Lebanon over the past few days, killing a number of people. This marks yet another escalation in the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah, which has continued unabated since October 7th. For the latest from the region, we go to Abdul. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. So, yet another Israeli attack in Lebanon. Could you take us to the details of what has happened and what has been the kind of uh, impact of these attacks? Well, Prashant, Israel has been uh, targeting Lebanon for quite a uh, time now. In fact, ever since the war in Gaza began, they have been carrying out some kind of attack inside southern uh, Lebanon as well. So in the similar context, there were attacks on uh, Tuesday and uh, there are reports also coming that on Wednesday there were attacks as well. Uh, uh, there are also attacks in Syria, Damascus, uh, where there is a reportedly two people uh, were killed. Uh, uh, the number of casualties in Lebanon, of course, uh, in uh, Wednesday's attack is yet not clear. But uh, on Tuesday, uh, uh, some civilian uh, lives were lost and uh, uh, apparently some of the people were also wounded. And uh, in last few days, if you, we combine it, more than uh, 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 two dozen people, mostly civilians, have been killed in the Israeli attacks. And these attacks are quite widespread, unlike what uh, uh, were there in the initial days, uh, kind of limited to southern Lebanon. Now they are attacking almost every part of the country, mostly, of course, uh, uh, of course, most of the attacks remain in the southern part, but uh, uh, that has, uh, there are attack, there are reports coming uh, of attacks in Beirut or in other parts of the country as well. In fact, Israeli Defense Minister claimed that uh, they are, uh, they, in, in, uh, entire Lebanon, Syria and Syria are basically under their radar and they, they have the capability to launch attack uh, at any place uh, uh, in these two countries at any time. And therefore, uh, uh, is, uh, Lebanon, Lebanon should be uh, uh, kind of careful uh, when kind of they express their solidarity or uh, kind of stand with Palestinians, because that would invite similar kind of destruction as which is happening in Gaza at the moment. So uh, this he repeated on Tuesday as well while visiting uh, one of the advanced military uh, bases uh, in northern Israel, kind of claiming that the, uh, they, they will carry out, Israel will carry out uh, destructive uh, attacks in different parts of Lebanon. So um, if you see, most of the time they claim that the, these attacks are carried out against so-called military uh, installation, but uh, there are reports coming that on Tuesday and on Wednesday also, uh, the the Israelis airstrikes particularly targeted civilian uh, facilities, civilian homes, uh, and kind of destroying a lot of uh, physical infrastructure, apart from, of course, killing and wounding the civilians. Right, Abdul, in this context, how do you sort of see Hezbollah's response over the course of the past few weeks to what has been happening? Well, uh, Hezbollah, which has basically maintained uh, that it supports the Palestinians uh, we, who are suffering Israel's brutal uh, aggression uh, in Gaza. Uh, and therefore, they basically, whatever they are responding to the Israeli aggression, are basically a responses to, uh, uh, basically an attempt to kind of express their solidarity to the Palestinians uh, in Gaza. But uh, uh, Hezbollah has uh, uh, repeatedly also warned that they, if they want, they can carry out attacks to all the places uh, in Israel. And in fact, uh, uh, they have uh, shown uh, that their missiles, their drones are capable of flying deep inside Israel uh, without being detected. In fact, there are reports coming that some of the missiles uh, fired by Hezbollah on Tuesday went uh, as far south as Accra without being discovered by the uh, Israeli, so-called Israeli air defenses. Uh, but uh, Hezbollah has maintained that it does not want to escalate the war uh, to, to the regional level and has basically maintained uh, that it, 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 it responses are primarily against the military installations in uh, inside Seba form, the occupied territory or inside the northern uh, Israel. And it has uh, avoided, of course, uh, as much as possible attacking or targeting any civilian infrastructure. But despite that, of course, Israelis are worried about it. And because of that, 
around hundreds of thousands uh, of uh, Israeli civilians have been evacuated from the northern Israel, and they are forced to live in different parts of the country. Uh, this, but despite all those displacement, Israel has not uh, taken any measure to address the concerns raised by Hezbollah. And that basically, that means, and in, in fact, even threatening uh, to escalate the war, because uh, it seems uh, that, as we have talked about this on this show before, that how Israel, particularly uh, the administration of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, wants to drag uh, Lebanon into the war so that uh, the war in Palestine can be prolonged as much as possible for the interest which basically serves Netanyahu personally, if not Israel at large. And, and that Hezbollah understands. And, and therefore, its responses have been very measured, very restrained, and only targeted uh, uh, to the military installations. Um, of course, with, uh, with kind of underlining the fact that they have the capacity to attack anywhere uh, inside Israel. And, 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 and Israel should be uh, uh, careful about uh, kind of provoking Hezbollah unnecessarily. Right. Abdul, thank you so much for that update. Negotiations have begun on the pandemic treaty, a proposal to learn from the mistakes and conclusions of the COVID-19 wave that hit the world. We talked about this on the show before and this round of discussions in Geneva is the second last round before a draft is finally discussed at the World Health Assembly in May. The current draft, while better than earlier versions, continues to be a site of struggle between the global north countries and developing countries. To get a sense of the issues at stake, we go to Jyotsna. Jyotsna, thank you so much for joining us. We have, been, we have talked about the pandemic treaty quite often on this show and now it's an important moment. Discussions are resuming. But for the benefit of viewers, could you first take us through what the treaty is and what has happened till now before we go into what's likely to happen? Yeah, thank you, Prashant. Um, so yes, uh, we have been discussing pandemic treaty for as long as it has been discussed at the level of World Health Organization, which is two years. The discussions have started in February 2022, uh, actually even before the COVID pandemic was over. Uh, so, but that was an effort by primarily by the developed countries to discuss a treaty uh, which can guide uh, the world about uh, how to respond to a pandemic. Uh, if it comes back in future. So they were not talking about COVID pandemic at all. And let us not forget that that was a time when the developing countries, especially Africa, was still uh, facing the heat of COVID-19. And um, still they were forced to discuss a future pandemic uh, when they did not have access to vaccines even that time. Um, so, so there was a lot of opposition uh, to the way the negotiations started. Uh, but well, um, uh, now we are uh, two years into those negotiations and uh, the mandate of the discussing group was two years. So it is expected that in May uh, this year, uh, when the World Health Assembly happens, uh, there should be uh, a final text in place. Uh, those are the expectations. That is the mandate. Um, so that is where we are. And we can already see the, there is a lot of heat that is there in Geneva at the moment uh, because a very, very long negotiation is going on. It started on 19th of February, which will go on till 1st of March. Uh, if I'm not wrong, this is the longest round of negotiations uh, in this uh, 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 while discussing uh, a pandemic treaty. Um, and again, there will be another uh, round uh, in March itself uh, later uh, in the month. Uh, so, so we are seeing a lot of things happening. Um, and uh, yeah, let us see how it goes. So, Jyotsna, so what is the current draft that is there? And, you know, what are some of the features of it, considering some of the issues we talk about in, on this show, which is equity, health for all, and access to medicines, for instance, considering all that? Right. Um, so over the last two years, uh, uh, the battlegrounds have been clear. On the one hand is primarily the developed countries and some other countries which support uh, them, uh, where uh, they are absolutely guided by uh, the big pharmaceutical companies, uh, be it the US or the UK or Switzerland uh, or EU in general, the European Union. They have been batting for uh, uh, more and more intellectual property barriers uh, in, uh, in these negotiations. They do not want to give access to people, 
to the medical products, be it, uh, medicines or vaccines or say ventilators, as we saw that there was such shortage of ventilators or a particular valve of ventilator wasn't available why so many countries could not have enough ventilators. Um, so, uh, or PPE kits, uh, masks, etc. So, so these countries are clearly saying that uh, it is more important for us to protect uh, the big pharmaceutical companies, our capitalists uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand are the developing countries uh, uh, and which are saying, and actually led by uh, by the uh, African Union, in that sense, it has uh, African Union has made very, very strong comments uh, saying that we cannot have things repeat what we saw during COVID. Uh, so those, uh, that is uh, the battlegrounds. We have seen ups and downs. Um, so the current text is not the worst that we have seen. We saw much worse text in the past. But at the same time, this is not, it is far from the ideal. Uh, we see some language in the text, uh, which uh, is talking about transparency which is talking about uh, the that the com uh, the countries should be able to review their national laws uh, to ensure that the uh, intellectual property barriers uh, can be reduced uh, during a pandemic uh, but at the same time uh, so what we are seeing is that uh, there is that language but it is not a mandatory language it puts an obligation that you should do it but you must do it um, and what definitely should happen, um, not leaving it uh, on the voluntary nature, but a mandatory nature uh, for certain very important provisions, that is still lacking. Um, so that is uh, still uh, uh, happening and one is fighting for. Apart from that, um, um, uh, uh, the... Uh, there is, uh, from the very beginning and not just during this pandemic for all types of uh, infections influenzas there has been uh, a debate regarding access and benefit sharing provisions for access and benefit sharing which means uh, that if there is uh, a new pathogen that is coming up and it is a pathogen of concern uh, then uh, information about it should be put out uh, in the uh, public domain uh, now, it will be used by the companies uh, and developed countries to make vaccines and medicines. Now, if you have received this information free of cost uh, and in uh, as public good, then they, uh, they should also be able to share those vaccines and medicines with uh, the others, with the countries, with the developing countries that uh, the developed countries are not agreeing to. So on the one hand, you are ensuring, mandating that you get uh, the data of pathogens but the products that you make you don't want to give it to the poor populations um, so that uh, battleground is still uh, very strong and one has to really fight uh, the other thing on 19th uh, of February you saw many civil society organizations and activists making statements uh, based on a text that was shared uh, they are constantly appealing and that has been again and again asked for uh, from the activists from the beginning that there should be transparency and accountability about the negotiating process itself and it is important because um, in November we heard uh, Geneva Health Files which is a media house uh, uh, which reports every global health from Geneva. Mm, Preeti Patnayak leads, uh, is the editor. Uh, uh, she reported that uh, the African Union's uh, negotiator actually had to step down and go back uh, to their country because under pressure of US and UK because this negotiator was making very strong points. Um, so, so, uh, so, so there are these things that happen in civil society saying that uh, we also need to be part of the process. We, these things should not happen. It, there should be more transparency. For example, the texts come out very late and before you can read and analyze, the negotiations begin. So it has been a problem. Uh, we do not know how the negotiations are happening. Finally, there was a presentation made by the WHO but it was too little too late um, so uh, so we need to know how things are happening because there is there are also fears that the private sector is has a lot more intervention and at a uh, backdoor talks are happening with the private sector and by private sector I would say the big uh, big companies uh, and uh, but those kind of uh, consultations and negotiations are not happening with the civil society formally or informally in both the ways uh, so that process itself how negotiations are happening should become transparent and accountable and again and again that is something that the civil society is asking for right, Joseph, thank you so much for that update we'll come back to you once the negotiations are over to see what the new draft that we have definitely thank you Prashant.
And that's all we have in today's daily debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meantime, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.